Hi, I'm Noam Wasserman, Dean of the Sy Sim School of Business at Yeshiva University. I was a longtime professor at Harvard Business School, an entrepreneur, and a venture capitalist. I wrote the bestseller, The Founder's Dilemmas. And I'm Charlie Harari. I've been working with companies for over 10 years. And that book, The Founder's Dilemmas, and the challenges faced by the 10,000 founders in it is the basis of this podcast. We are delving into the issues faced by startups to help you avoid the pitfalls that claim so many good companies. Let's get started. Welcome back to our podcast, Founders Dilemmas, Founders Dilemmas Podcast. Of course, always feel free to reach out to us at founderslemmaspodcast at gmail.com. We are continuing um, our episodes with Brian. He is talking to us about his journey. Um, it has been fascinating. Until now, if you haven't heard of episode one, go check it out. This is episode two. Dean, kick us off. Okay. Thank you, Charlie. Welcome back, Brian. Uh, delightful to recatch up with you. Uh, Long time friend and uh, someone who is uh, someone I very much learned about a new part of the economy from something awesome. that is eight percent of the economy and is often an on- entry point for people into entrepreneurship. Um, and so we went through a bunch of the founding days with Brian, a bunch of the forks in the road, a bunch of the ways that he recovered from mistakes, learned from them, and then executed beautifully on a being a stronger uh, Brian than he had been before that. Um, and now let's take it off into uh, the next stage of it. We were just talking about being able to find people who have the right thing to uh, be a franchisee as opposed to the need to build it. Instead, the ones who can be able to, uh, to execute on the system. And Brian talked about uh, the three characteristics, focus, faith, and effort. Uh, Brian, let me just get into a little bit of being able to tell. Those are all intangibles. Those are all hard to evaluate. Um, and there's some ways, interestingly, that um, this is one of the things I had learned from you about how the franchising agreement helps you be able to filter out those people, helps you be able to make sure that they will be devoting their full focus, their full effort, and uh, that they're very much believing in the model. Uh, talk us through a little bit about how that helps and then uh, where the gut has to enter into being able to judge people. Yeah, starting with the franchise agreement, we almost never, ever pull it out of the drawer and hold it up to a franchise partner and say, hey, you committed to doing this. At that point, the relationship is clearly dead anyways. We are about relationships. We're about putting in the work to find the right people from the outset and spending enough time in that courtship period to say, yeah, we've, we found the right person. This is right for you and right for us. Uh, Eric Church, our uh, president, you'll often hear him on a, in an interview with a franchise candidate trying to talk them out of it. You know, this is going to be the hardest thing you've ever done and, and, and literally trying to get them out at a time when it's easier than getting them out at a later stage if they've made the wrong choice. To me, in finding the right people, I know, Noam, you said uh, those are all intangibles. I think almost everything in an interview process as you get to know someone is intangible. We never really know. We've had franchise partners that have had all the pedigree and the track record, and they seem like they're going to be amazing, and they fall flat. And we've had the opposite. We've had young, hungry, green people work out to be absolute rock stars. So we do our best. And it comes down to another intangible you'll love. Uh, I call it the beer and barbecue test. And when I interview people, I'm rarely going through any sort of hypothetical situations or what they've done in their past, but I get to know them. And I almost pretend we're having a beer together. And I find out what makes them tick. What do they love in life? Is there a shared common passion? Why are they doing what they're doing in this world? Have they figured that out? Have they figured out what really motivates them? And if they do, if they're clear on their why, surprisingly, things seem to work out quite nicely. If someone has a purpose greater than money, because whenever I've seen anyone go, money's my main thing, well, you know, they generally make some poor decisions. I find that in an all about people motivation for me, we can look at money and go, yeah, we've got to be a profitable, long-term profitable company. But when we're putting people first, it acts, it allows us to act differently in some of the decisions we make. So the beer test, would you have a beer with this person? The barbecue test, how would they fit at a company picnic or company barbecue? Do we see these people uh, interacting uh, with that group? We've got introverts and extroverts alike, lots of diversity, but it's just how does it fit? Are they, are they taking our team to a higher level by being a part of that team, by being a franchise owner in the system? Will they make it better for everybody? 
And so yeah, again, so I definitely on. agree in terms yeah. of uh, where you were starting with, in terms of if you have to pull out the contract, the franchising agreement, you're in trouble. The same thing with almost any contract. One of the sure. intriguing things that I found though, is that when you are having them sign on to the business, mm -hmm. their willingness to put franchising fee into it is yeah. saying to you that they have the confidence in the system when they are willing to give a slice out of everything in a royalty to the franchisor, that's saying that there's more value to me in buying into the system than doing it myself. And so Correct. a bunch of the ways in which the buying into the contract hopefully means later on, you will have picked the right person, they have will have signed on to the right terms, and you never have to go and pull it out again after that. Mm -hmm. 100%. And it's things like the royalties. People will often look at the royalties and they'll say, but you don't add enough value for that royalty. That tells us that person isn't the right fit versus mm -hmm. someone that goes, that royalty is only that? You do all this for that fee? We want someone to know that we've created the brand. We're building a national brand. When we get on the Ellen DeGeneres show and the Oprah Winfrey show and different press and PR, I mean, those things add to our momentum where someone should be able to charge more than if they were to build this business out on their own. And that should justify alone the royalties that they're uh, partnering with us on. Okay, so let's head into a little bit more of the next stage of uh, the development of 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Um, early on, taking on the first after eight years, the first franchise uh, that you're going to be able to add to that equation. Say over the next 10 years, what was the percentage of company-owned versus franchise locations that you guys had? So we had one company-owned, which was the one I started. I don't remember the exact year that I sold it off to a franchise partner who still owns it today. Um, but we decided, you know, we are, we're going all in on franchised units. We are a franchise or that's our business. We were no longer in the junk removal business. We were in the franchise business and I wanted to stay focused. And when I really realized how important it is that we're all in on franchising, we sold off our corporate unit. Now, it's changed a bit. As the company's grown and we've got 1-800-GOT-JUNK, Wow One Day Painting, and Shack Shine, we've got managing directors or effectively presidents operating each brand independently. We have since gone back to corporate units and we started to buy some back. So I think we've got nine today. We find a franchise that might be struggling, underperforming, the wrong franchise per partner, or someone that just says, like, I've, I've aged out, I'm done, I, you want to move on. We buy back that franchise, maybe put in a new team, more often develop the team that's already currently there, and we see the business double in a matter of one to three years. So at this stage, when we it's not interfering with our own focus, getting into the corporate side has is, is made a lot of sense. Yeah, it's very interesting just to highlight for people that very much the typical one is that franchisors keep a certain percentage of the company-owned stores that they run alongside their franchisees. Mm -hmm. And so there's a very different approach that you took, much more, I guess, is back to drastic, Brian, I guess. You know, sure. we tried out the company-owned model. Now we've become convinced that franchising is the way to go. We're going to go fully in that direction. And then over time now, you've gotten to a little bit more of a middle ground, but even now, an atypical middle ground. I want to I want to highlight something for those that are listening. You know, one of the things that I'm learning from you, Brian, and just hearing you speak, is what I what I what I see is your commitment to your values. And, and I said this yes. earlier, but I really want to drive it home. Meaning, you said you were focused last episode, and then now we're talking about how you're 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 saying to yourself, "Hey, hey, I'm a franchisor now. That means we got to get rid of our corporate owned store. That's a manifestation of your value." Yes. And, and I think it's important for those that are listening that when you're a leader and you have a value, that means you follow it to the end. Mm -hmm. And you will see that when you follow something to the end, you'll find your success, even though it's a little bit more murkier. Like it's, it, it was a much more of a, I, I think, a murky decision to say, should we give up our last corporate-owned franchise? Mm -hmm. But because you're value-centered and you're willing to go to bat for your values, it seems like a normal thing for you because that's just how you operate. But I just want to highlight for those that are listening, that's a, a measure of, that's a manifestation of, 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 of how to become successful. Identify your values and actually see it to the end, which is to me what that move was. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost asking yourself, is this a value or is this a horizon that I'm shooting for that I'll never actually attain? Yeah, it, yeah. It's a strong value. 
that we are a franchisor. And at the time we made that drastic Brian decision, but we, the story was other franchisors held on to corporate locations as a way to test new product and service ideas. We realized that wasn't working for us in our own franchise. We were better off partnering with a very committed franchise partner who would do a better job testing and proving some hypothesis. And so we'd put a new service offering into a franchise or two and try different ones at different times together and A-B test. And it was way better than even having our own corporate location. But yeah, commitment to values, incredibly, incredibly important. Reinforced by strategy and where so at the nexus of strategy and values yep. is where Brian then doubles down on every bet that he is making. All right. Okay, very interesting. So Brian, let's get into a little bit of the the difficult sides of it, mm -hmm. uh, especially when it's coming to growth challenges, uh, team and other things like that. What was the toughest of the growth challenges that you had at 1-800-GOT-DRUNK? Well, they seem to come around and, and occasionally repeat themselves in, in different ways. But one of the challenges is finding the right leader at the very top. So I brought in Cameron Harold, who was a, a, a best friend and uh, a fellow entrepreneur in a different business. And he came in and helped us grow from 2 million in revenue to 106 million in revenue. It probably should have ended at 75 million in revenue. Cameron, talented guy. We're still friends, thank goodness. But we were two ADD type entrepreneurs, fire ready, aim. And you can't have two people leading the business in that style uh, at that size. And so things started to fall apart. We were making rash decisions and constantly sort of, you know, felt like a tennis game back and forth, back and forth. And people are like, why do you guys keep flip-flopping and changing? We made the change. I had a tough decision to get Cameron out. It was uh, well thought out and uh, it was a tough, tough thing to do when you, I was the best man at his wedding. Um, and that repeated itself a little bit. I then overhired the next time and brought in a a woman who was the ex -pres an ex-president of Starbucks of their U.S. operations. And I thought, oh, man, I've recruited this person to come back to Canada uh, for half the salary. This is going to be unbelievable. What a win. And we weren't aligned on the vision of the business and the value and an entrepreneurial vision. And uh, almost lost my business, almost bankrupted my business in 2008 during the financial meltdown when I had this leader on board. So I had to get that person out and then find very carefully the right person. Eric Church has been around 11 years. But you know, as much as I say it's all about people from uh, how to find the right people and treat them right, it can be one person that you found in your business that isn't necessarily a bad person, but they're the wrong fit for the business that can just destroy and eat away at what you're building. There's people yeah. that will challenge you on values and say, those aren't the right values. Well, they're, they're, they're my values and they're the company's values before you came in. This is where we have to go. We need to have the discipline to stick with them at all costs. So um, I love a good challenge. I love when someone says, Brian, you're wrong. I, I never want to be the smartest person in the room. Um, but there's certain things we won't compromise on. And, and that is values. values yeah, so there's, no, there's some devastating irony. I think that when I found out about Cameron, um, I don't know if you remember what the inception was of our meeting, but you had a wall at 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Um, it was essentially the big hairy dreams wall yeah. where people were putting up their big goals and everything. One of the lines on it was to have 1-800-GOT-JUNK become a Harvard Business School case. And yeah. it was because of that that uh, you, you guys approached me and we danced together and saw that it made sense to do it. Do you remember who suggested that? It's Cameron Harold. Exactly. Yeah. And the case would not have existed if not for your best man uh, who is there, who then you had to do the difficult thing uh, of firing and essentially moving him on to be able to have the next person who's going to be able to take the reins from him. Yeah. And what's not, what a nice ending to that story is that Cameron and I it probably took six months to a year for us to kind of heal what had happened. Uh, but we remained great, close friends. And what I love about that is Cameron says, and he would say this on this podcast, that it was the best thing for both of us. He just didn't know it yet. And it's turned out to light up his life to focus much more on writing books, the speaking circuit, the coaching, all the stuff he does. I mean, I think he's written six books, way more than I have. And, uh, and it's unbelievable. So these things happen for a reason. And it's hard 
when people can't see it at the time. But if you make decisions in an it's all about people way, um, I think they come around to respect that it was the right thing. Okay, so let's get into a little bit like big picture lessons learned and other things like that. Uh, one of the lenses on it is that you then went on to found another franchisor. Mm. Um, and that often gives us a lens. What did Brian change the second time compared to the first time? Uh, mm. Where did he vary from the model? Where was it an important enough lesson? He didn't know it before, but he was mm. able to apply it now. What did you do differently at WOW, your uh, painting franchising follow-up to 1-800-GOT-JUNK? Mm. Well, it was an acquire situation. So I had someone come into my house and they wowed me. They painted my home in a day and I was blown away. And I asked the founder if he'd ever franchised. He said it would never work. He tried. I said, I think I can help. And uh, the rest is history. We we bought the company, partnered with him, ended up buying him out. But one of the mistakes we made was sometimes you do things the way you've done them before and it's not the right way. So the look and the feel of 1-800-GOT-JUNK, these bold colors, the blue, the green, a big flashy logo, um, it wasn't what WOW one day needed. We took the existing colors, which were a, a purple and a sort of yellow gold. It looked very collegiate, like a football set of football colors. And I started getting feedback from people. Sorry, it was almost an orange color. And uh, I got a feedback from people. It, it, it seems very collegiate. You seem like a college painting outfit and there were lots around and that's not what people wanted from us. And then I had a customer, a uh, customer friend who said, Brian, if you're trying to build trust in your organization, which is what you do when you've got painters coming in and flash mob painting your home in a day, why would you have them dressed in penitentiary orange? So they were wearing the orange of the brand and it just hit me. I'm like, oh, this is not what this brand needs. And we rebranded the look and the feel and we completely changed the logo um, and built something that was much more about trust that connected with people that was a happy brand. And so the branding style before didn't work. And that was one of the biggest uh, sets of change. The other one was painters and other painting companies critiqued us all the time and said, you can't pay a home in a day. And we had to go out there and, and convince our new franchise candidates that would come to the table that don't listen to what you read out there. This can be done. We're doing it each and every day. And our franchise partners that are slowly coming in are making money and building a life-changing business of less disruption. Why would you have someone paint your home in a week if it can be done in a day? And so, again, doing the impossible and inspiring someone that it can be done uh, was a big change there. Okay, let's talk about a little bit of the nexus of business values and philosophies and uh, parenting values and philosophies and stuff like that. Um, some very intriguing things that you've done about uh, um, the approach that you have to having your kids think entrepreneurially, um, other ways in which you're trying to raise them with the values that you have. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the, the overlap and the interplay between the two of those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I very much keep business and personal separate. So when I when I'm done Thursday evening, I take Fridays off as a family day. When I'm done Thursday evening, I turn off my email. I don't check on the weekend. There's extreme circumstances, but generally speaking, I won't check it. When I'm away on vacation, so I'll go away for a two weeks or a five week vacation and I go dark, I call it. I get my assistant to actually change my passcode to social media, to my email, so I can't get in bar none. And it allows me to stay focused and present with my, my kids, to be there for my three young kids, which, you know, two are teenagers now and they're growing up. I want to show them my work ethic, my passion for staying focused and present with people, for listening. But the big thing I want to show them, I, I believe as a parent, our, our job is to love and teach. And, and how can I teach my kids in such a way that they can find their passion in the world? Show them what I'm passionate about passionate about travel, passionate about business, helping the world. I brought my daughter to a speaking event where Charlie and I were sharing the stage. She was 10 years old, sitting in the front row going, what's my dad doing? But she learned so much from that experience and she's in business school today. Um, one interesting question I've never asked my kids, not one of them, what do you want to be in the world? What do you want to do? What do you want to be when you grow up? I don't want the pressure that I felt as a kid coming from a father who's a liver transplant surgeon who used to ask me that all the time. And he'd tell me, you know, you're saving your Hanukkah money and your Christmas money for, for what? For university. 
I wasn't really saving it for university, but I'd put that in my thank you notes because I thought that's what I had to do. For me, I want to open my kids' eyes to the world. We went to Kenya to help build a school. We took them to India and help build a, a little community there. And I just want them to see things. They will find their passion and I can help encourage. I can ask them questions, but I don't want them to think, oh, I got to run the family business. I got to do this and that. I want them to explore on their own. And my job is just to sort of hold it up for them and let them see new things. That's a delicious microcosm, having your assistant changing the password oh, so that you don't have any okay. choice but to be focused on the parenting, bringing the parenting values to your kids and uh, all the other great things that uh, you've been able to illuminate for us. So thank you, Brian, again, for the time, the insights, the decade and a half worth of uh, my being able to learn from you. And thank you for now enabling us to bring it to the rest of the world. Awesome. Well, thank you to both of you for having me. And uh, as I said from the outset in episode one, I love doing this stuff because I end up learning and reflecting and it's uh, it's amazing. So thank you again for having me as a guest. We, we totally appreciate it. There's so much to learn. And for those who want to ask us questions, please found the dilemmas podcast at gmail.com. We look forward to seeing you next time.